Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the topic for the day is, is Thoreau and American Transcendentalism. I hope you had fun reading Thoreau. I think Thoreau is, is one of these writers that um, is not meant to be rushed through. You really should take your time to enjoy reading Thoreau. How many of you guys have, have read Walden before? Had, has anyone? Uh -oh. No one? Okay, it's interesting because it used to be kind of required in high schools and such. I didn't know if it, if it still was. Um, you know, I, again, there are just a few of these books in our Intro to Philosophy class that I find myself returning to. I didn't used to find this very interesting. I'd owned a copy of Walden since I was in like junior high and I'd kind of skimmed through it and didn't find it very interesting. And, and later in life, I kind of rediscovered it and started finding it interesting again. I hope um, I can put it in some context and point out some passages that that speak to me that uh that you can carry with you guys uh that you guys can carry with you the rest of rest of your lives um let's go ahead and dive in get the class started so the attendance question for the day is this what are the most transcendent experiences you have ever had and um just to remind everyone where to find the discussion forum um, it's down here. You'll have to oops, gotta move everyone out of the way here. You, you'll have to hit show all because this module is down under the fold of the first page here. So module 24, Transcendentalism, just post your responses there. Try to do that by the end of the day, please. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. So uh, Thoreau, in the mid-1800s, decides that he's going to go live on Walden Pond. He basically squats <laughs> and builds himself a cabin alongside Walden Pond, which you can see behind me in the in the video here. I grabbed a screenshot of a picture of Walden Pond and put that behind me. As much as I'd love to be at Walden Pond right now, fishing and and uh, you know being out in nature, I'm I'm stuck indoors with stuck here with you guys. <laughs> it's, actually, it's just as good of a way to spend the morning as being outside by a pond, probably. Um, so yeah, Thoreau basically decides to build a, build himself a cabin cabin start working the land, supporting himself, and he basically lives on his own for an entire year, trying to be as self-sufficient as humanly possible. Um, what does the term transcendent imply to you guys? This is, this is a really interesting uh, question. You have to, if we're going to talk about transcendentalism, this is the key term. What does it mean for something to be transcendent? What does transcendentalism even mean? What does it imply to you guys? Um, maybe something that's like beyond like being like what's normal i don't kind of <laughs> yeah i i think it, it can mean a lot of different things it's definitely something beyond the normal and i think the 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 heart of transcendentalism is that most of our lives are lived in the average territory you know we get up and we go to work and we take care of the business and we pay the bills and we do our homework and we write our papers and we get things done for our jobs and we spend time with family and it's fairly average no matter how amazing those things are that's normal life but there's a certain category of human experience that is beyond that or I hesitate to call it better because you can find transcendent experiences even in the most ordinary things, I think. As, as you see in reading Walden, I think that Thoreau finds transcendent experiences in the most seemingly mundane, seemingly ordinary parts of his life. Um, so I hesitate to say that, that, that it's somehow different than day-to-day -day life. But something heightened, something, some special category of experience. It's not clear at all how metaphysical it really is. It could be uh, some sort of special access to reality. You know, if you're religious, then if you have a transcendent religious experience, then you're communing or connecting with the divine in some special way, in some special experience. Um, if you are um, a, a nature lover, being out in nature can... can uh, uh, connect you with reality. You can perceive the, the connectedness and the oneness of things. Um, you know, if you're metaphysically inclined, you can have some uh, Gnostic access, some special access to the nature of reality in these transcendent experiences. It could be transcendent experiences with other people. Um, so it's, it's hard to really know what exactly transcendence means. And I think this is one of the criticisms of transcendentalism from a, from a philosophical standpoint is it's a great term, but what exactly is it? It needs some philosophical analysis. Um, where, it, and I, I guess this is a question that I have for you guys. And this is, this is the heart of, of the attendance question. I worry, and I think Thoreau may be worried about this even in the, in the 1800s. 
I worry a bit that this supposedly seemingly special category of experience is being bred out of us in this very practical, very performative age where, you know, what I would call a data driven age where everything has to be measured and quantified and, you know, the, get the, the things Leotard was talking about in the postmodern condition, the best input output equation, you know, put the, mo put the minimum effort in, get the most output, uh, you know, the most bang for your buck, so to speak. In these very practical times, do we actually take the time to seek out transcendent experiences anymore? Do we even believe in them in the first place? Or do they count for us as a special category of experience? Um, I asked a similar question uh, last semester when I taught this class, and I was actually really surprised. I was surprised at, um, of course, I wasn't doing it online because we hadn't had the coronavirus pandemic, but I, I was surprised at kind of the blank stares I got back from, from students, people who were unable to uh, look back at their experiences, look back at their lives, however long or short their lives had been. You know, if you're 18, you got 18 years of experience. If you're 40, you got 40 years of experience. Uh, people who are unable to kind of look back at that and, and, and identify particular moments as uniquely transcendent in some way. And, and of course, that's going to mean something different to everyone, presumably. Um, in terms of American transcendentalism, it's, it's very much wrapped up with the environmental and conservation movements. You know, if, um, if you look at nature and you see kind of its grandeur, its glory, its interconnectedness, something that is more, um, more beautiful than your ordinary notion of beauty, something that's worth preserving. You can see why, why uh, this notion of a transcendent experience with this wide open country we had in, in, the, in the United States, and we still have to a large degree, um, you know, a, as we started to sort of migrate west um, in, in the, in the 19, uh, 1800s. Uh, you, you can see, I think, that this, this concept of transcendent experiences when applied to nature and applied to the wide open, untainted, uh, natural uh, environments of the United States, how this became a movement, <laughs> uh, a philosophical movement and a, and a literature movement. Um, you know, well, let me dive in. I wanted to look at a, a couple of examples, but let me give you a couple of key terms here that I think, I think will be helpful. Two of the key terms for understanding transcendentalism are these two terms, what's known as the ineffable and the sublime. Something is ineffable if it's unable to be captured in words. Now, this is a really interesting uh, shift for philosophy to take because up till now, um, maybe up until, until, up until Nietzsche and up until postmodern philosophers, you could reliably uh, take for granted that philosophers thought that the nature of reality, the nature of our experiences, could be described linguistically, could be conveyed, could be written about, could be analyzed philosophically. Um, you know, for Plato, he thought that, you know, forms could be discovered through philosophical analysis. Um, the ineffable are things that are that are unable to be captured in words. And I don't know if you guys have a sense of this. I can look back at moments in my own life and identify experiences or uh, either of nature or of reality or of the divine or of other people that I am unable to capture in words. You know, I can try to write about it. I could write a poem or I could write an essay or I could do some philosophy or, and I could try to describe the experience and it's just unable to be captured adequately. So that quality, the, the inability to be captured in words is called ineffability. Um, the ineffable is one way to put it, but things that are ineffable are things that you can't capture in words. Now, what are those things? Those things are sublime. And the, 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 the word is interesting. Sublime means under the light <laughs> or, or at the foot of the light, right? Right next to the light. So something is sublime if it's so great that it just can't be calculated, measured. Um, uh, it's, it's, too, it's too great, greater than your ordinary sense of great, more beautiful than merely beautiful. You know, I think we have this ordinary sense of beauty, like that's a beautiful painting, or that's a beautiful person, or that's a beautiful poem, or that's a beautiful wetter, whatever. The sublime is greater than that. You know, and uh, one of the ways this is captured in, in um, American culture, and this is fascinating because I'm not an art historian at all, and I didn't used to appreciate this connection, but now I find it really interesting. One of the ways that this has been captured in American culture is through transcendentalist artwork paintings and whatnot. So I've got a selection of transcendentalist art that we can look at together. 
Um, just to give, give you a sense of what transcendentalists had in mind. And again, the interesting thing about um, any form of transcendentalism, if it's Thoreau writing about his experiences on Wal Walden Pond, if it's Emerson writing his essays, if it's Margaret Fuller writing, writing her essays, if it's uh, you know, painters trying to capture something of the sublime artistically, none of those things capture it perfectly. It's like an imperfect, it's, it's, it has this platonic quality to it. It's like an imperfect copy of this thing that just cannot be captured linguistically or representationally. So I, wanna, I just, last night I sat down, I, I gathered a few of these examples for us to look at together so you can get a sense of what, what transcendentalism means in American culture before we ever dive in and look at Thoreau. So here's a great example uh, of a transcendentalist painting. Among the Sierra Nevada, California by Albert Bierstadt. You can, there's something in this painting that is, is, it has a grandeur, a natural beauty to it. It's not just focusing on one particular object in nature. It's trying to capture the grandeur of nature as a whole. The lighting in the background coming through the clouds, the, the uh, interconnectedness of nature with the animals and the landscape, and again, the scope and the scale of it. Something that just cannot be captured perfectly, squeezed into something that humans can understand, a painting or a poem or a, an essay or, 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 a, or a class for this matter. <laughs> um, but this is an example of transcendentalism working its way into culture. And I, I, again, what's interesting here is they really believe there's no way to capture this adequately. I can talk about transcendentalism. We can analyze this painting. But this painting and those words used to describe this painting are, are, are imperfect words that are trying to capture the sublime, which has this quality that is ineffable. It's unable to be adequately captured. It has to be lived. It has to be experienced. It has to be seen and perceived. You have to be immersed in it. You know, it's like... You, it's like trying to describe someone who's never seen the ocean and trying to describe what the ocean is like to someone who's never seen it. You can try to use words all you want, but you'll never adequately be able to describe it. If you've never seen the Grand Canyon and you're, you know, you've read accounts of it, maybe even seen photographs of it, but then you see it in person before you, bigger than you ever expected it to be. That's the kind of thing that can't be captured. So again, these paintings are just imperfect representations of this, this notion of the sublime that is ineffable. It cannot be described and can't be, can't be represented. Here's another one I like. I've been to Niagara Falls. It's impressive. And uh, if you haven't been to Niagara Falls, you should go to Niagara Falls and see this in person. But here's a great example of uh, uh, trying to capture the grandeur of something representationally, but failing in the process kind of by definition, because the, the object of the, of the painting is uh, sublime. It's so great and so beautiful that it can't be captured or measured. And it has these qualities that can't be described or even adequately represented, but we can try imperfectly. So this is a great example of, uh, uh, of that. One I've seen in person, this painting is interesting. It's, it's an enormous painting, The Icebergs by Frederick Edwin Church. Uh, it's at the Dallas Museum of Art, if you ever find your way down to Texas. It's a huge painting, and the colors are just amazing. You would never, you'd never even know it from looking at this, uh, at this um, uh, digital copy of it. But when you're looking at like this little blue section right here, it looks like you're looking through an iceberg. It's amazing, the detail and the, and the way light seems to play through it. Again, it's this attempt to try to capture the sublime or capture the ineffable in some way our human minds can understand knowing that we're going to fail. But again, this is a, a, a supposed to be a, a grand landscape. And I've never seen this in person. The, the, you know, I've never seen an actual iceberg in person, never been to Alaska, never been to the, to the Arctic at all. But I can imagine what it looks like. And I've seen pictures. And I can only imagine what it looks like in person. But this painting is, is, is amazing. It does a pretty good job of capturing the grandeur of this scene in a, in a painting, but also kind of failing in the process. I've got a couple more. Um, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone by Thomas Moran. Um, I wasn't too familiar with this one, but I was Googling paintings and, and thought this one fit right in with what I was trying to convey. You know, again, there's a grandeur to the landscape. There's an interconnectedness. There's, a, there's a, an immense beauty to this scene that can't be captured. Um, this is a very classic painting that um, is used to, to describe transcendentalism to some extent. And this, this is interesting because it, it, it conveys a person kind of looking out on the scene. And I think that's, that's the heart of transcendentalism too. 
you know, a human trying with our imperfect minds, trying desperately to grasp and understand and have some sort of access to the divine or to nature or to reality or something quasi metaphysical, but not being able to capture it, not being able to use words, not being able to preserve those moments. And I think if you've had experiences like this in your life, and I've, I've had many, I can point to, you know, um, you know, like I'm trying to think of things that come to mind, like climbing a mountain when I was, uh, when I, when I was a teenager, you know, going, starting at the bottom and hours later being at the top of the mountain, there's a, there's, and seeing the vista, like in Yosemite, uh, you know, from the top of, uh, from the top of mountain, I just climbed that has this kind of quality. Um, even something like uh, I used to sing in a choir, like I, I performed Mozart's Requiem with a choir with an orchestra behind me. There was something grand and magnificent about that and about being Im not just listening to it, but being immersed in it, creating it in some way. And those experiences, uh, again, they can't be captured in words, but a, a quality that they have to me is that they're temporary, they're ephemeral you can't preserve them. They happen, they're in the moment, they're special and you know it. And when they're gone, they're gone. You can't recapture those moments. Presumably new moments in the future will come and different, different new experiences of transcendence. But each one of those special experiences is special for a reason. They don't last. And you know, every day when you wake up and you look out the, out the window or go outside or get out in nature or climb that mountain, whatever it is, when you recognize the beauty of that, not just of the scene in front of you, but of that moment, the quality of experience that that particular moment has, knowing that it's a finite moment. And I think this, is, this speaks somewhat to, to stoicism that we talked about some time ago. Our lives are finite and our experiences are finite. And for each one of these special moments, um, those moments don't last forever. <laughs> they come and they go. And uh, if we're failing to recognize the special quality of those special experiences when they arise, I feel like, and I think Thoreau would say, we're missing an important part of the human experience, of, of our human nature, of our ability to relate to each other and relate to nature and re relate to reality. We can get so caught up in the busyness of life that we don't, e we don't take the time to seek out these transcendent experiences. And we also don't recognize them when they come along. We give them, we fail to recognize their special nature and put them in some sort of ordinary category. And from talking to people, talking to students last semester, talking to you guys, talking to you know other people I know, family members and whatnot, um, I think this is this concept is not in vogue. The concept that there are special, unique, transcendent experiences that are so outside the ordinary that they're they're worthwhile. And I think Thoreau is saying you have to actually take time to seek those out. Um, and I worry that we just don't do that. We, get, we, we make ourselves busy all the time. You know, I've got work and I've got, a, got stressed out about this thing and I've got these things to figure out and I've got these uh, homework assignments or papers to write and I've got to worry about what's happening next week and all these, all this minutia that fill our minds keep us from seeking something transcendent. So I even wrote a blog post about this, if you're curious. The blog post was, was titled, Seek Out Transcendent Experiences Every Day. Like, if you're not seeking out something transcendent every day, I feel like you're missing out a part of the human experience. It could be something grandiose, or it could be something really small. Like, for example, uh, right outside my window here, I've got a bird feeder set up. I love watching the birds. You know, the birds come, they eat, they socialize with each other, and I can kind of commune with nature while I'm doing my work. And I, I purposely try to say, okay, I'm going to stop doing my work for five minutes. I'm going to sit here and sip my coffee and I'm going to watch the birds for five minutes. And, you know, that's a, a very small example of an ordinary day-to-day -day transcendent experience you can find. And you can find uh, countless examples of these. And this is going to mean something a little different to everyone because I think different people uh, are moved in different ways by, by different things and different types of experiences. But if you're not finding something for yourself that's transcendent every day, I feel like you're, you're missing out. Uh, it occurred to me, um, and this is never a connection I would have made years ago, but you know, I'm from California and now I've moved to Idaho and there's a, a large Mormon population here. Some of you were raised Mormon, some of you weren't. But it occurred to me that even Mormon artwork is, is influenced heavily by American transcendentalism. So I found this painting. This is not too old of a painting. It's fairly recent, 20 some odd years old. Hope on the Horizon by Greg Olson. Again, this is basically a, a spiritualized version of this painting. It's basically the same painting, essentially. 
Um, so a lot of religious artwork has this quality. And this has always been true. If you look back at the history of Christian artwork, um, Christian artwork, unless you're kind of a, a, a like a, a Methodist or, you know, someone who thinks that, you know, religious iconography is, is potentially um, a distraction from experience with the divine. If you think that you can kind of access the divine and commune with the divine in some way through artistic representations, visual representations, musical representations, um, then all of that artwork, all of those experiences, all of the creativity, the musical creativity and the artistic creativity, the purpose of that is to try to capture something of the divine representationally so we can relate to it better here in this human sphere. And a lot of religious artwork, not even just in the Christian tradition, in the, almost any religious tradition has that quality, trying to capture something transcendent here in the natural world um, in a way that is imperfect. You know, again, relying on these concepts of the sublime and the ineffable, this special beauty or special uh, quality that certain things in reality have and the inability uh, for us to adequately capture our experience of, of those representational, re representationally or linguistically. So what I want to do now, um, I actually want to make this class session a little bit more interactive than we've made uh, our, our last couple of virtual class sessions. Um, what I want to do, I actually have um, divided, I, I've spelled out the different sections inside Walden. You could call them chapters, but sections are, are just as good. I want to focus on a few of these. I'm going to uh, basically let people sort of pick and choose these. I've got a select select batch of ones I want to look at together. I'm going to each, I want each one of you to take one of these sections that I'm going to list out for you here in a moment. We're going to take 10 or 15 minutes, kind of go offline. I'll, I'll mute myself. You guys can mute yourselves. Dive into those sections and try to find two or three or four short passages, you know, aphorisms, nuggets of wisdom that you find inspirational or controversial or worthy of philosophical discussion, something that speaks to you uniquely. And then we'll come together and we'll just run through those and talk about them as we go. I don't have anything too prescriptive in mind in terms of which passages to look at, other than the fact that I've whittled down this list. There aren't enough people here to go through the entire book. And, and some passages, I think, are more philosophically interesting than, than, than others. But the entire book is a really interesting account of you know, finding the transcendent in the ordinary, the ordinary experiences that Thoreau has in nature or with other people or the chance encounters that he has or his day-to-day -day routine or being self-sufficient is his way of, of encountering the divine, encountering the sublime and uh, in, in finding transcending, transcendent experiences, even in the ordinary parts of his routine. So let's see, uh, I wanna see how many, how many participants we've got here. So we've got um, nine, including me, so there are eight people. I think this will work perfectly. So the sections I wanna look at are economy, where I lived and what I lived for, reading, sounds, solitude, visitors, higher laws, and then we're gonna skip a bunch and go right to the conclusion. So I'm just gonna go down the list here and you guys can grab these as we go. Who wants to look at economy, the very first section? If not, I'll just assign people if people don't speak It doesn't up. sound like the most terribly interesting, but I'll do it. <laughs> okay, it's also the longest, but you know, you don't have to right. just, just skim. Okay. I'll just find something. Okay, you've got economy. Uh, how about where I lived and what I lived for? Who wants to grab that one? I'll do it. Okay, reading. I'll do that one. Okay, how about sounds? I can do that one. Okay, solitude? I'll do that one. Okay, visitors? I know there are enough people here. I can do that one. Okay. And uh, higher laws? I'll do that one. Okay. And the conclusion? Should be enough people for someone to grab the conclusion. Okay, nothing hurt. I'll take the conclusion. So um, again, um, you should have the reading from Blackboard. I'll actually share this presentation inside the uh, the chat here. So let me let me grab the link to this. So 
just in case you don't have the Blackboard reading handy. Oh, how do I grab this? Hmm. Is it a Google Docs thing? Yeah, I just need to grab the link to it here. I'll open it in a new window. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment so I can, there we go. I couldn't access the bar in my browser. Give me just a moment and I will grab the link here. Okay, so I'm going to put a link to this PowerPoint inside the uh, chat for anyone who needs the readings. And if you go to the slide that I'm looking at, I'll share my screen again. If you go to the slide here, these are actually links. You can click right to those sections of the reading. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. I'm gonna sip my coffee and look at, look at the conclusion. Let's uh, reconvene in say 11.15. Um, uh, and how many things do you want us to get? Just two or three or four. Yeah, okay. no, yeah just short passages though. Not, not, not long, long, long passages. Find the, find the kernels of wisdom inside, inside each passage. Two or three okay. or four. Some of these are long passages, some are quite short. So. Okay, so I'm gonna mute and I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I wanna go through this fairly quickly because as much as I, I love having these class sessions like this, I wish we had like a three hour class to spend more time so we didn't have to rush through some of this material quite as, quite as much, but that's okay. The first section I wanna start with is not actually the first one, economy. I wanna start with where I lived and what I lived for. So I'm gonna click over to the reading here. I've got a few passages selected. So who had where I lived and what I lived for? Um, I did. Okay, so what did you come up with? You wanna just point us towards the, a couple of passages that you found most salient? Yeah. Um, so one passage that I really liked um, is it starts off, we must learn. Where, where uh, is that? How far, how far in there? It's about, I want to say it's, a, it's like towards the end of the passage. So like not in the middle, but not. What, how, how does the paragraph start? Um, it starts, we must learn to reawaken. Okay, maybe, maybe doing it on the screen like this is not going to work. We might just have to read it. That's okay. okay. We can just read it. Everyone has it in front of them. It's fine. Okay, so it's, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite ex expectation of the dawn which does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a con consequence and devour. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful, but it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look which morally we can do to affect the quality of the day that is the highest of arts. Every man is tasked to make his life, even in its details, worthy of the contemplation of his most elevated and critical hour. If we refused or rather used up such paltry information as we get, the oracles would distinctly inform us how this might be done. So that's a pretty lofty passage. What, what did you uh, get out of it? Um, so I got out like that, like, pretty much what he's saying is we tend to like sleep through life and not take everything into like everything in our lives into consideration and so for us to like view how beautiful objects in the world are and in nature that we must like reawaken yeah, yeah. The so, thing, the, the thing that's interesting about Thoreau is you have to be comfortable with his metaphors. You know, we tend to sleep through life, right? I, th I, I think if a lot of you, if you looked around at people around you, you probably go, yeah, a lot of people are essentially sleeping through life, not literally, but metaphorically. They're they're missing out on being their best, un most unique, 
transcendent self. And he paints a really interesting picture. He says, every person is tasked in life to make his life, even in <laughs> even the most ordinary things that we have to do as human beings, worthy of the contemplation of his most elevated and critical hour. That's a great way to put it. Live your best life every moment, even in the most ordinary things. Don't sleep through your life. And I think he worries that most people are essentially asleep, <laughs> metaphorically. Yeah. What else? Did you come up with any others? Um, I did, yeah. So this one's easy to find. It's the very um, last passage or hey. paragraph of um, the section. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's time is but the stream I go a fishing in. I drink at it, but while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. It's then it's thin current slides away, but eternity remains. I would drink deeper, fish in the sky whose bottom is pebbly with stars. I cannot count one. I know that I know not that first letter of the alphabet. I have always been regretting that I was not as wise as the day I was born. The intellect is a clever it discerns and rifts its way into the secret of things i do not wish to be any more busy with my hands than is than is necessary my head is hands and feet i feel all my best faculties concentrated in it my instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing as some creatures use their snout and for paws and with it i would mine and burrow my way through these hills i think that the richest vein is somewhere hereabouts so by the di divining rod and thin rising vapors i judge and here i will begin to mine so, so again what are the what, what are the takeaways there what do you think he's saying um so i i kind of think he's saying like i guess to what my understanding is that um basically how like fish kind of flow in streams and how um they kind of go about their way um kind of like this was kind of like a little bit harder for me to understand but I liked it because like I could kind of get what he was saying like with the intellect um and how like he's not as wise as the day he was born but he like wants to you like his head and his hands are as his feet um and kind of like, I guess, reinventing himself in a way. It's interesting because I think Thoreau and anyone like him probably has this dual relation to their own intellect, right? On the one hand, it's what lets you understand things. It's what separates us from other life forms, arguably, right? Um, mm. He calls it a cleaver. It discerns and rifts its way into the secret of things. It, it reveals the inner, inner nature of things. On the other hand, it can be such a distraction from 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 that innocent experience of living in the moment you know when he when he talks about fish in the pond and he looks up and he sees and it gets a metaphor right fish mm -hmm. in the sky and pebbles are the stars and this you know focusing on the immersiveness of the environment and the moment and the grandeur of it and all of the um the beauty and the ordinary experiences of things that we cover up and we get distracted from because of our intellect so he's saying here i wish i, I like the way he puts it he's how does he put it he says um I, I have always been regretting that I was not as wise as the day I was born before he used to, to uh, cover up the beauty of things with his intellect. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard because you have to put that in check, you know, we, you know, especially for us rationalist, uh, you know, modern and postmodern thinkers, you know, we tend to analyze things and not enjoy the experiences of them. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other passages from this section? I've got a couple. Um, I didn't. Not like not any that really interested me. Okay, let me uh, highlight a couple of them here. There's one passage in particular that I think is a really um, it sums up uh, transcendentalism kind of in a nutshell. And I'm always looking for the the you know me. I'm looking for the sound bites, the things that that uh, that that summarize an entire view really concisely. <laughs> I think this this is the transcendental quality of what Thoreau was going for. It says every morning. Was a, cheer, was a cheerful invitation to make of my life of equal simplicity, and I may say innocence with nature herself. I have been as sincere a worshiper of Aurora as the Greeks. I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise and one of the best things which I did. How many people have ever bathed in a pond? I have. I bathed in a river, you know, when I was camping. I don't know if you guys have ever done that kind of thing, but it is. You're, you're radically immersed in nature. They say that characters were engraven on the bathing tub of King Chich Thang to this effect. Renew thyself completely each day. Do it again and again and forever again. 
I can understand that. Morning brings back the heroic ages. I was as much affected by the faint hum of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn when I was sitting with door and windows open as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. It was Homer's Requiem, itself an Iliad and Odyssey in the air, singing its own wrath and wanderings. There was something cosmical about it, a standing advertisement, till, for, till forbidden, of the everlasting vigor and fertility of the world. The morning, which is the most memorable season of the day, is the awakening hour. Just think of how ordinary some of this stuff is. You know, you've got to bathe, you've got bugs flying around. A great many of us would be like, oh, this is terrible. I got to go out and get in the cold water and these bugs flying around and all this stuff I got to do today. It's like, no, 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 this is the awakening hour. This is, this is the religious experience of being immersed in the world. And that's the key move for Thoreau, I think. It's not just an experience, it's a religious experience. It's a transcendent experience. Even in the seemingly ordinary, mundane things that we have to do every single day, finding something transcendent and unique about those experiences. But no, most of us just kind of, you know, sludge our way through through life and uh, and don't focus on on making magic out of the ordinary like that. Um, there's a, a classic passage here. Everyone probably knows this passage. Even if you've never read Thoreau's Walden before, you probably know this passage. It's one of these oft-quoted passages. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, then why, why then to get to the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world? Or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my, my next excursion. For most men, it appears to me, are, strangely uncert are in a strange uncertainty about it, whether it is of the devil or of God and have somehow, somewhat hastily concluded that it is the chief end of man here to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know, think about this. You know, he talks about stripping out all the non-essentials, you know, all the modern conveniences, all the, the social factors of life, focusing on what human life is at its most fundamental so we can really experience living and not be distracted from living. And, and I, again, if that was true in the, in the 1800s, it's more true for us with social media and politics and the global world and all the requirements and hoops you have to jump through and all the things we tell people are important. Thoreau's saying all those things are really distractions from the things that, that really matter. There are a couple of, of other passages I just want to cite from this section, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next section. Um, he talks about the railroads. Um, uh, you know, the railroads are a sign of the times, right? Everyone moving faster. We can move goods across the country. Um, he talks about the telegraph, the way in which people can communicate across great distances now. And he's largely critical of this. Um, let me find the passage here. Uh, if I can... Sorry, it's hard to do this uh, on the fly. Here we go, this passage here. Starting in the middle of it, you guys can find it yourselves. He says, it lives too fast. Men think it's essential that the nation have commerce and export ice and talk through a telegraph and ride 30 miles an hour. I mean, imagine that, 30 miles an hour being fast for the time, right? That was, <laughs> oh, a train can go 30 miles an hour. That's, look how fast we're moving. Of course, look at us nowadays with our highways and high-speed rail and airplanes and you know it's it's just been magnified in the last uh, 150 years um without a doubt whether they do or not but whether we should live like baboons or like men is a little uncertain you know this is fascinating do we do we live like animals while we're while we're doing all these things or do we live like human beings it's a really important question what does that even mean if we do not get out sleepers and forge rails and devote days and nights to the work but go to tinkering upon our lives to improve them who will build railroads? We do not ride on the railroad. This is a great passage. We do not ride on the railroad. It rides on us. Think about that for a minute. We don't ride on the rail. Or you could say on airplanes or in cars or in our modern houses or, or any of these modern conveniences and ways of being. We don't really own them. We don't really ride them. They end up controlling us. 
Did you ever think that what those sleepers are underline that underlie the railroad? Each one is a man, an Irishman or a Yankee man. The rails are laid on them and they are covered with sand and the cars run smoothly over them. They are sound sleepers, I assure you. And every few years, a new lot is laid down and run over so that if some have the pleasure of riding on a rail, others have the misfortune to be ridden upon. That's true nowadays too, especially, especially in this coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, people losing their jobs and, you know, we have all these modern conveniences. We built a modern economy, but you know, every time someone's thriving, someone else is getting trodden upon and you know, losing their job or being treated unfair, unfairly or, or whatnot. That's the price to pay of this fast-paced way of life. Um, later in the passage, he's, I love this, he's critical of the post office. And uh, again, you could plug in a lot of things. You could plug in email, you could plug in 24-hour news, you could plug in social media, whatever you want here. It says, for the most part, I could do without the post office. I think that there are very few important communications made through it. To speak critically, I've never received more than one or two letters in my life. I wrote this some years ago that were worth the postage. Think about this. How many, how many actual communications that you receive are genuinely worthwhile, things you can't live without? Not too many. The penny post is, common, is commonly an institution through which you seriously offer a man that penny for his thoughts, which is so often safely offered in jest. I love this next part here. If I am sure that I never read any memorable news, and I'm sure that I never read any memorable news in a newspaper, if we read of one man robbed or murdered or killed by accident, or one house burned, or one vessel wrecked, or one steamboat blown up, or one cow run over on the Western Railroad, or one mad dog killed, or one lot of grasshoppers in the winter, we never read of another. One is enough. If you were acquainted with the principle, what do you care for a myriad of instances and applications? To a philosopher, all news, as it is called, is gossip, and they who edit and read it are old women over their tea. Yet not a few are greedy after, after this gossip. There was such a rush, as I hear the other day at one of the offices, to learn that the foreign news by the last arrival, that several large squares of plate glass belonging to the establishment were broken by the pressure. News which I seriously think a ready wit might write a 12 month or 12 years beforehand with sufficient accuracy. So th think about this. You know, I... You know, every day we check our Twitter feeds and our Facebook feeds and see what's going on in the news. And he's saying, you know, if you've seen one instance of this, you've seen it all. If you've seen one friend's happy pictures of their family, you've seen it all. You don't need to keep up on what everyone is doing. If you've heard news of one disaster, you get the idea. There are disasters happening around the world. Why do you let those things drag your attention away from being in the present moment with the things that you have to do immediately and the, and the again the transcendent experiences that you could be having of reality all of these things that seem like they're good qualities in modern life and again i would plug in all of a, all of our you know, modern communication technologies here are distractions from those things and those are in our power to control but we we basically get uh, wrapped up in them caught up in them uh, you know, swept away on a torrent of information and forget to focus on those transcendent experiences in the moment. All right, let's move on to the next section. Let's move on to, um, let's go to reading. Who has reading? I have that one. Okay. What'd you find? Um, so I found a cup, like a, the only ones I found were all in one paragraph. They're okay. paragraph five and it starts out, no wonder that Alexander Got it. I'm putting it on the screen here. There we go. Yeah, so it's a few sentences in. Uh, first one says, a uh, written word is the choicest of relics. Um, and then a few sentences down. Um, books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Um, and the last one, I guess, is above it is the symbol of an ancient man's thoughts becomes a modern man's speech. <laughs> That's an interesting one. So what'd you, what'd you get from those passages? Um, so like the whole thing, it just talks about like the whole reading section about how important it is to learn ancient languages and the history and ancient and do the ancient readings because it teaches you how to live in modern days. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really interesting because, you know, Thoreau is, he's already kind of an anachronism. I mean, he's, 
you know, a contemporary, you know, again, modern 19th or a, uh, 19th century individual, mid 1800s. Most people weren't reading the classics at that point. And there's been a resurgence of interest in the classics since then, really. But even today, no one learns Latin and no one learns Greek. Very few people do. I, I learn Latin pretty well. I know a little bit of Greek. But how many people do you know speak Latin and Greek, much less read Homer, for example, in Latin and Greek? And what, what's interesting is there, I, you can emphasize the wisdom. Like, you can learn a lot from ancient authors. But I think what Thoreau is doing is a, is a little more subtle than that. He's actually saying in some again, kind of weirdly transcendent, almost metaphysical sense. When you read someone, you are communing with their minds. It's a meeting of the minds across time. It's, it's interesting. So, you know, despite the barriers of language, despite the barriers of time, if you learn Latin and Greek and start to read, say, Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, or, or anything else, Grecian literature, as he calls it in this passage, um, in, in Greek or, or Roman authors in Latin, you are communing with their minds it's a meeting of the minds across time with people that don't even exist anymore and there's something transcendent even in reading because you're communing with people and i think there's a there's a danger of misreading thoreau as kind of an isolationist saying oh you need to separate yourself from society go build a cabin and be out by yourself what he's really saying is and that's why uh the the the, the next passage here um the next section visitors is so is so important because he's not only talking about the solitude but he's talking about the the visitors that he has along the way people that's come by his cabin to sit and have tea or uh, have conversation or people he would trade with you know these are kind of chance encounters and some of them are really superficial and not worth having but some of them are genuine meeting of the minds you know real conversation where you get to know someone deeply and that's the kind of thing that happens face to face in conversation with various people we encounter in our lives. But it's also the kind of thing that happens mind to mind when you're reading, when you're reading someone's thoughts, reading a letter, reading a book, reading an essay, reading something that was written 2000 years ago, you are communing with that person's thoughts. And there's something transcendent even in that. So he's not an isolationist. He really is saying that you know, we can be uh, social in a transcendent kind of way, or we can be social in a way that distracts us from all these transcendent, um, transcendent qualities and transcendent experiences. We can focus on the superficial as opposed to the qualitative and, and in-depth. We can, uh, and with reading, he talks about the way in which people read really shallow, shallow literature. I'm trying to find a, a relevant passage here. Um, Yeah, uh, this passage here, I'm going to highlight it. He says, the works of the great poets have never, been, have never yet been read by mankind, for only great poets can read them. Think about that. The works of great poets have never yet been read by mankind, kind of as a whole, by the common person, in other words, for only great poets can read them. If you're, in other words, if you're, if you're not, if you're not po a poet, if you're not artistically inclined, if you don't seek out transcendent experiences, you'll never really have those kinds of experiences and those kinds of connections because it, the message is lost. <laughs> it falls on deaf ears. They've only been read as the, the multitude reads the stars. Again, Thoreau is always using a, a metaphor. At most, poems and literature and whatnot are read, he says, astrologically, not astronomically. Most men have learned to read to serve a paltry convenience as they have learned to cipher in order to keep accounts and not be cheated in trade. But of reading as a noble and intellectual exercise, they know little or nothing. Yet this only is reading in a high sense, not that which lulls us as a luxury and suffers the nobler faculties to sleep the while, but what we have to stand on tiptoe to read and devour our most alert and wakeful hours to. I wanna continue this passage a little bit because I think it's really important. I think that having learned our letters, we should read the best that is in, in literature. This is quite a challenge. You know, having learned to read, we should read the best that's ever been written. I, I, this is a, a serious question for you guys, you know, and it's not, it's not meant to be judgmental, but how many of you guys and women in your spare time read literature? Read the best that's ever been, how many of you read Shakespeare? How many of you read poetry? How many of you read the classics? How many of you read the classics in English, much less classics in other languages? Most people don't do that. And so Thoreau is saying here that once you've learned to read, you should read the best that's out there. Use your faculties for the best, that, the, the best uh, qualities that you can. He says, you know, we read 
we we're forever re uh, he says otherwise i'm paraphrasing now we're forever repeating our abcs words of one syllable in fourth or fifth fifth grade classes sitting on the lowest and foremost form all of our lives most men are satisfied that they've read or hear read and perchance have been convicted of the wisdom of one good book the bible he says maybe people read the bible <laughs> But they don't, they don't read other things. They don't read the best that's out there. For the rest of their lives, they vegetate and dissipate their faculties in what is called easy reading. You know, and you, people who read pulp novels or who read the news or who read, you know, stuff on the internet or read stuff on social media, whatever. There is work in several volumes in our circulated library entitled Little Reading, which I thought referred to a town of that name, which I had not been to. <laughs> uh, and he goes on and on like that, but. Um, on a little bit later, this is quite a challenge. Again, the best books are not read by those who are called, even by those who are called good readers. Um, that's sad. And I think, I think that's, I, I don't know if that's more true now or less true now, but I suspect it's more true now that, you know, people don't take the time to dive into the best that's been written, maybe in college, but even in college, you get this kind of, uh, academic approach to it. You analyze it and you write papers about it. How many of us really immerse ourselves in someone else's thoughts through literature or through the classics or through philosophy with the goal of being immersed in it, with the goal of sucking life out of it, with the goal of communing with those authors, to, a, a meeting of the minds to make those authors our friends across time. That's what he's saying here. Most people don't read that way. Um, another couple passages, I know I'm dwelling in just a couple passages here and it's a shame we don't have more time, but that's okay. You guys can read this on your own. Here we go. Or suppose he comes from reading a Greek or Latin classic in the original, whose praises are familiar even to the so-called illiterate. He will find nobody at all to speak to. This is, this might be true of, of a lot of things, not just of reading, but if you really take the time to get immersed in something, if you you know, I don't know if it's philosophy for you guys, for most of you, it's probably not, but it, you know, I find this to be true. If you really get fascinated by ideas, whatever you're reading, whatever you're encountering, oh, well, let's, I'm really interested in Thoreau, or I'm interested in Plato, or I'm interested in whatever, you know, uh, if you're interested in literature, oh, I'm interested in Shakespeare, I'm interested in Byron, I'm interested in uh, Yeats, whatever it is. Um, and even if you have hobbies on something, how many people are you going to find to talk to about that? <laughs> Not very many. It's a pretty lonely life in a way. He says, so you'll find nobody to, at all to speak to about it. You keep it to yourself. You must keep silence about it. Indeed, there is hardly the professor in our colleges who, if he has mastered the difficulties of the language, has proportionally mastered the difficulties of the wit and poetry of a Greek poet. Um, this is an interesting kind of view. I think he's really saying, and I think this is true. I find this to be true more and more, that if you if you really want to understand human nature, I'm going to broaden this to talk about philosophy a little bit now. If you really want to understand human nature, I think I agree with Thoreau here. You don't read um, philosophy of human nature. You know, you can talk about Kant's view of human nature. Or you can talk about David Hume's view of human nature. Or you can talk about... Um, John Stuart Mill's view of human nature. Um, th does that really capture human nature? I think he's saying here that you learn a lot more about human nature by reading the classics. You know, before all this Western culture kind of uh, deviated from, from this, Im this immersive grandeur that you see in the classics, Nietzsche thought something similar to this. He found a grandeur and a glory and a strength of character in, in classics and in classic epics like the Iliad and the Odyssey that don't get reflected inside Western culture. So even people who are reading these things kind of miss the point. They don't see the grandeur. They don't see the transcendence inside those experiences. Um, a couple of the things I wanna highlight, we don't really have time to dive in, uh, into depth too much, but in the, in the section called Sounds, he talks about the railroads, I, again, you know, kind of hearing the, you know, while he's you know tilling the soil and hoeing hoeing the weeds out of his beans out of his bean field, uh, you know the railroad is going by, and he's kind of you know listening to the the sound of the whistle, kind of waving to the people on the train as it goes by. Again, there's this dual nature to it, and I think for in for us contemporarily, 
this is really important. You know, we live in a largely urban society, even in a little town like Idaho Falls, it's largely an urban environment. You've got stores and shops and businesses and streets and cars and, you know, same thing as if you're in San Francisco or New York City, it's just a difference in, in scale, right? What's interesting is Thoreau's kind of being an escapist. He's out there on Walden Pond, um, living by himself, having chance encounters with people, but he's also finding transcendent experiences even in the most modern of things. And the train whistle going by and the beauty of that scene. In fact, I, I, right now I live pretty close to the railroad tracks and one of my daily experiences is enjoying listening to the train go by. I kind of stop and look out the window and I've always kind of been a train buff and you know, I'll kind of enjoy the train going by. And if I happen to be outside, I'll kind of wave to the engineer of the train. And I, I, I relate to this. There's, there's something transcendent about even, some, even the most modern experiences like that. You know, it could be the internet. It could be, you know, being on the, if you're in the 1950s or 1960s, driving around on the brand new highway system in your, in your automobile, you know, there's a transcendence to those kinds of experiences. So what Thoreau is saying here, he's not being an escapist. He's saying you can find transcendent experiences, even in the most urbane, most modern uh, experiences that we have, you can seek out those transcendent experiences. Um, I think we'll stop looking at the passages, but I, I want to look at the next slide I've got here. Give me, give me a second to get back to the slides. There we go. So, you know, what, what's the takeaway here? Um, I think it's important philosophically to ask, is Thoreau and other American transcendentalists, are they on to something here? Is there a special category of human experience, which they call transcendence, that kind of by definition transcends the ordinary, more beautiful, more grand, more immersive, um, more revealing of reality, more revealing of nature, seeing the interconnectedness of things, communing with other people in special ways that are outside the ordinary. Is that a special category of experience or is Thoreau kind of blowing the ordinary out of proportion here? Maybe being poetic and romantic about it, but not really doing good philosophy. Criticism, critics of, of American transcendentalism basically held that, you know, they were doing kind of philosophical sleight of hand. They were romanticizing and being poetic about certain kinds of experiences, but they weren't really doing any genuine philosophical analysis. They weren't really, they weren't really revealing reality in a special way. It's, they just romanticized certain Certain, uh, features of our ordinary experience. And I don't know how to put this. I, I suspect this myself. I feel like romanticism is completely out of vogue these days. People don't, and not just in a narrow sense, not just being romantic romantically, but being romantic about things, about being immersed in um, your chosen career or your profession or your academic career or your hobbies or relationships or anything. You know, that kind of romantic grandeur of the of the experience and the and the trajectory and the path of pursuing those things is not romanticized culturally very much anymore in a way that it was in 19th century romanticism for example um, the literature shows it so that's a question is, is this a genuinely unique category of experience and if it is why aren't we seeking it out if it's really that special why aren't we finding more of it and i think this is a challenge from thoreau is to find more occasions in your own life whatever that means for you to 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 be transcendent and seek out those experiences but i really feel like with all the distractions that we have modern conveniences and modern lifestyle yes but i also mean even academically even when you read are you really reading to 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 uh, find the transcendent in the thing you're reading, to find the sublime, to find something ineffable, to commune with authors? Or are you um, merely reading to accomplish something? Are you reading to check things off the list and get your credit so you can get your degree, so you can move on with your practical life? Whatever you're doing, whatever your hobby is, whatever your project is, whatever you're pursuing, um, focus on on the grandeur of it, focus on the beauty of it, focus on the immersiveness of it. Make make an experience out of it and find the transcendent, even in the ordinary things. I think that's what Thoreau is saying we need to do. Um, you know, can you access the divine through transcendence? I think if, if you're religious at all, you essentially think that this is how we interact with the divine. We have these experiences of the divine, whether it's through revelation or through communion or through um, worship or through prayer or through meditation. That's a way of accessing the divine. Through, through some sort of transcendent experience. I think religion, most religious traditions have some notion of transcendence built into their religious experiences, Christian or otherwise. 
then it's an interesting question of what things count as transcendent. And, uh, you know, these, this is going to be a different list for everyone, but it's a pretty broad list. You know, it could be nature, you know, being, being out there in nature is transcendent, you know, like Thoreau, or, uh, Thoreau out there living on Walden Pond, climbing a mountain, going to the national parks, walking through a meadow, going fishing, whatever it is. In fact, there's another author I really like named Henry Bugby. And he's really, uh, he's a kind of a poetic journal style philosopher in the tradition of Thoreau. He talks a lot about fly fishing, seeing the fish emerging out of the pond and the connectedness of things. And it's, it's poetic, but there's something transcendent about that experience. So it could be nature. Music, if you're a musician, music arguably has this quality, right? You know, when you're really in the zone playing music, when you're in, if you're doing a performance, if you're listening to an amazing, uh, amazing musical performance from someone else, a band or an orchestra a, a, or a singer, or whatever it is, if you're creating it yourself, those are all transcendent experiences. Again, they're sublime, they're beauty beyond the ordinary sense of beauty, but also something that's unable to be captured in words. That music, right, and, and our reflection on, after the fact about that music is trying to capture in words or capture in our memory or capture uh, metaphorically the things that, that just can't be captured adequately because they're too sublime. Religion, obviously. Uh, an interesting one from the 20th century, altered states of consciousness. I mean, there was a whole movement in the late 20th century from Timothy Leary, like his experiments with LSD and psychedelic drugs, trying to figure out ways to alter our states of consciousness, to be more open to, trans to, to transcendence, to, to have transcendent experiences and access different levels of reality through altering our consciousness through psychedelic drugs. That's a little out of vogue nowadays, but in the 60s, it was all the rage, right? Um, you know, the, the whole psychedelic culture of the 60s in some sense revolved around, around, uh, around drugs as a way of, of opening our consciousness to transcendent experiences. Not one I have any experience of really, but uh, I've always kind of thought it would be interesting to try LSD as a result of that. If that's a way of accessing a different level of reality. It sure sounds interesting, but I don't know if you guys have experience with that. Definitely don't quote me and say your philosophy said, instructor said to go try LSD. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. You could, you could misread me that way. You know, for some people it's sex and sexual intimacy, passion with other people. That's a type of transcendence. Reading and writing, some, even the most ordinary things like Thoreau says, um, communing with other people socially, when a friend comes by for coffee, when you, uh, and when you have good conversation with someone, quiet moments with someone else, those are all social communal experiences, either in your own mind or with other people. And those are transcendent too. So I have in, in mind here a very broad sense of transcendence. Some people read Thoreau as being very narrowly focused on nature, but I think Thoreau is saying something much broader here. I think he's saying that in the, you know, whatever you're, you're doing, the most ordinary things, whether you're being an individual or being social, whether you're focusing on um, the, the task at hand or you're thinking, uh, you're, you're climbing a mountain, whether you're reading works of literature or you're um, hoeing your beans, what, whatever it is, you can find something transcendent in all of those things, but you have to make them transcendent. Otherwise, they're going to come across as mere ordinary, mere drudgery that you have to get through. So it is an interesting question. Is transcendentalism a form of escapism? Thoreau seems to be modeling some form of escapism, but all of his writings don't seem to imply that. He's much more social in his writings than you would uh, uh, infer from the way he was living on Walden Pond. So that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, if you guys don't have any questions from here, we'll go ahead and call it a day. Um, so uh, I won't see you guys till next Tuesday. Uh, I've got the paper assignment for paper four um, already entered into Blackboard. So if you want to get started ahead on paper four, if you're planning to write that extra credit paper or if you're taking the, the op uh, second option, option two for completing the class, writing a fifth paper, you'll want to get started on paper four so you can move on. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about the requirements for the class. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Too. Thank you guys have you. a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Thank you.